Our goal was to 3D print arms for Daniel so that he could feed himself again and take care of himself. And our goal was to then also teach other people, Daniel and other people, to 3D print prosthetics so that the work could continue after we left. We printed an arm for Daniel. He fed himself again for the first time in two years. And we taught eight young men in the Nuba Mountains who had never owned a laptop and never seen a 3D printer, even heard of a 3D printer, to print prosthetics. And the work continues. They're continuing to make arms. And it has forever changed the relationship of being an amputee. I think what's profound that we did is we lit the fuse. We showed that a certain misfortune called amputation can be addressed through technology. What excites me is not that we've changed the way the amputation is thought of in South Sudan and the Nuba Mountains. What excites me is the fact that everything else that's gonna happen after this that we didn't even instill, how they deal with other things, how they modify the arm that we taught them how to make. That's, I think, where human brilliance and human ingenuity is gonna take hold. And I guarantee in one year from now, when I go back, the arm that I taught them will be so much better, will be so much more precise, will be so much more specifically appropriate for the region and for the needs of the people that actually are gonna be using that arm. My name is Mick Ebling, and I'm the founder of Not Impossible Labs. Everything that Not Impossible Labs is about is about using technology for the sake of humanity, using technology to do good in the world. I've just always been fascinated with technology, so I think there's this thing in me that loves to see things that are supposed to not be done be done. So how do you look at something that someone says, oh, you can't do that, or that's impossible, and then how do you reverse that and actually make it possible? And I think this fascination or this using the tool to overcome no and overcome impossible has been something that just recently has just become this natural extension of who I am. Intel came on as one of our financial and technology sponsors for Project Daniel. So they put in money so that we had the resources to do what we needed to do, and they gave us laptops and two-in-ones to be able to go over there and actually use them. There's all kinds of companies that we looked at to help us with Project Daniel. And there's a tremendous amount of integrity and authenticity of what we do and how we do it and we looked at 3D printing companies. We looked at everybody, because we just knew we had to get over there. When you look at Intel as a partner, they are behind, behind, behind the scene, driving technology forward. I went to Intel because they had the technology to get this done. Project Daniel says to the world that you don't have to be an expert in any type of technology to go out and do something. I am far from an expert in 3D printing, but I was able to go do something. So use me as a case study. Project Daniel, I think, will teach the world that anybody has the ability to learn technology. It's not about education. It's not about socioeconomic status. Technology is a ubiquitous medium and all you need to do is expose it to people and they will take it and blow it out and take it so much further. Project Daniel came about because I was at a dinner having a conversation with somebody and we were talking about what I was doing with Not Impossible, talking about this concept of technology and humanity and he casually says, you know, I work with some people and I've spent a lot of time working with people in Africa and there's a lot of amputees over there. And I said very casually, you know, I could be over there next week and we could be printing these people limbs with 3D printers. And he said, what did you just say? And I was very kind of cocky about the whole thing. And I said, yeah, this is totally possible. I, you know, I just met a guy who created a thing called the RoboHand and this is what he's doing. And yeah, we could totally do this. And he said, well, then let's do it. 
And I said, something you should know about me, don't taunt and don't dare me to do stuff like that because I instantly will do it. It's the easy button for me. You want to get me to do something, then dare me and I'll probably do it. And so we talked for a second and I said, yeah, let's do it. And he said, all right, well, there's this doctor in Sudan named Dr. Tom, Dr. Tom Katana. And he told me his story about how he's this doctor and he's in the Nuba Mountains. And the Nuba Mountains is pretty much the only hospital in the area and it takes care of all of the people who are in this, this struggle between Sudan and the Nubans. And he said, this doctor is over there. I'd love, to, I'd love for you to meet him. I'd love for you to know him. And, and I said, great. I came home from a dinner at 11 o'clock at night and I was actually sitting right here. And I opened up my laptop and I researched this Dr. Tom and had Dr. Tom had helped this young boy named Daniel Omar, 14 years old, who had his arms blown off. I didn't need to reread it. The second I read it, the second I saw the photos of Daniel with, with two stumps bandaged, I have three boys. I couldn't imagine that ever happening to any of my boys. And I just knew I had to do with something. Three D printing, in its simplest form, is just a pastry squeezer that squirts out molten plastic and it layers it line after line after line until it builds a three dimensional object. That's all it is. Three D printing is the same thing as two D printing, where a piece of paper goes through a printer, except for that piece of paper that goes through the printer is a platform. And instead of it just being one, you know, tiny layer of black ink squirted onto that piece of paper, it's thousands and thousands of little dots of black ink sprayed on top of each other so that it builds up. That's all it really is. Between knowing that Daniel needed an arm and actually going and making him an arm, I had to learn 3D printing. I had to teach myself the physiology of making an arm. So I invited a bunch of people much smarter than myself to my house and we had a hacker weekend. And on the sixth day, I flew to Sudan with plastic and printers and tools, landed there and the journey of Project Daniel began. There's no desk jobs in the, in the region that Daniel's from. You're a farmer, you raise goats, you live off the land. So when your ability to actually work the land is taken away from you, your ability to essentially live is taken away from you. I mean, it's really that simple. Someone else has to do all the things that you had to do to live, especially losing both hands, both arms. There's really, I mean, there's really nothing that you can do. The thing to understand about Africa is that there is a paper thin line between life and death. And that line is being able to eat and being able to drink. If you can accomplish that, then you have the chance to live. When you take away the ability to feed yourself and use your arms to feed yourself, you've now created a situation that is virtually a guarantee that you're not gonna be able to survive unless there's someone there to take care of you. So Daniel losing his arms, his instantaneous response was, I'm gonna be so much of a burden on my family now. If I could have died, I wish I would have. That's why he said that. It wasn't being morose, it wasn't being woe is me. It's the reality of the fact that everybody's fighting to stay alive every single day, and now you gotta fight to stay alive for themselves and somebody else. That's just a lot to take on. The irony is that the people are so loving, so passionate, so giving, is that they gladly help other people. They gladly would take care of Daniel.
there's many things that they had never seen. They'd never seen a six foot six bald white guy. That's for one thing. They had never seen a laptop that turned into a tablet, that turned into a laptop, that turned into a tablet. They had never seen something that could do that. And they had never seen or even heard of or fathomed this box, this black metal box that would actually, after you hit print, would actually manifest something physical that you could pick up and hold and, and touch. So there was many things throughout this trip that people were looking at, and that was not just the locals, but it was people who worked for NGOs, it was you know expats who saw this and were like, this is incredible, I've never seen something like this before. It, just, it was just oh, the overarching thing, it was just really remarkable. I mean, you want to talk about a motivation not to fail? Have a boy with no arms whose name is Daniel and your whole project is Project Daniel sit there and watch you do what you're supposed to be doing and fixing for him every day. And then you run into every obstacle that could be delivered. The printer jamming, the filament melting, the electricity not being right, everything that could malfunction or go wrong did. But at the end of the day, you're still looking across at Daniel sitting there, you know, playing, playing his two-in-one with his stump arms you know, every now and then kind of looking up, not speaking English. I mean, that's, that's why it got done. You just figure out how to overcome all those obstacles. And so I figured out how to take apart a printer. I just learned how to print two weeks before, and now I'm taking them apart and disassembling them and putting them back together again. I had no idea the consistency of filament and what conditions would make filament melt. So we just problem solved and we went in and we realized, okay, we can't print during the day because it's excruciatingly hot, let's print at night. So, well, first we, we put fans on it and the fans didn't cool it down enough. So then we printed at night. Then at night, because the overhead lights and the lights of the printer's bugs started to be attracted to it. So the fans blew bugs into the engine and the, or the motor and then the motor jammed because there was bugs in the motor. So I had a cool, I had my filament at the right temperature, I had my motor at the right temperature, but now I had bugs in the motor. So it was just one thing after another after another. But we just, we just kept printing. And then on November 11th, we fit Daniel with his, his arm, and after all the prototyping and all the misprints and all the this and that and the other, he put his arm on for the first time. We took a little extra piece of plastic and, and melted a little handle so that he could, someone could slot a tin spoon into it, and he fed himself for the first time in two years. That's one of the highlights of my life so far. The two-in-ones allowed students who had never worked on a laptop before the ability to interact in a very natural way. Everything about the two-in-ones, you can always touch the screen. And so the ability for the students in Goodell to actually be able to manipulate and create the arms by using the touchscreen was such a tremendous, unexpected benefit to the entire process. There's an intuitive nature of just touching. It's picking something up. I can reach across and pick something up, or I can say, I want that or that. And when you're doing that and actually touching what you want, that's intuitive, that doesn't need to be taught. When you're forcing a human to go through an interface and that interface results in something taking place on a screen, there's a translation issue. And if you're not familiar with it, there's a familiarity, there's a motor skill, there's a, a whole thing that has to be developed. When you can just reach across and, and touch something and the magic happens, that was an unexpected and incredible benefit to the entire project. You know, the psychological effects is such a first world concept. You're alive or you're dead. That's the concept in Sudan. You're alive or you're dead. You can feed yourself, you can drink water, you're alive. You can't, you're dead. So if something horrible happens to you, are you alive or dead? It's really that simple. And I didn't understand that at first because I watched people trip or fall or, or hurt themselves and everybody would laugh and I thought it was I thought it was a cold, somewhat cruel response. I almost knocked myself unconscious on a, on a low-hanging beam and everybody broke into hysterics. And I kind of thought, wow, that's, that's really not nice. 
And what I learned was, you're not dead. So if you're not dead, there's, there's a bit of rejoicing that needs to take place. So yeah, you hurt yourself, but you're not dead. And so psychological trauma, of course it's there. I don't think it's really talked about because look, are you alive or dead? And we gotta get back to farming and we gotta get back to raising our goats. So let's move on. I think that we're just ground down by life and we're constantly, we, we, I think we start off as kids with these sharp edges and then life just grinds us down and we're, we're constantly told no. You know, the average three-year-old hears the word no 400 times a day. Now that's usually in sequence. No, 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 no. You know, when they pick up a knife, but we're ground down and and I think that by the time you get through high school, through college, you get into a job and now you have, to, you have this hierarchical structure of who you're supposed to answer to and who gives you permission to do things. And we're trained, we're these Orwellian trained robots that have to go through this process of life. And the street sign says stop and the traffic light says go and you can't make a right here. And there's all these rules. So we're constantly conditioned of what we can and can't do. And the reality is you can run a red light there's just ramifications to it, you know? You can go ahead and hop on a plane and go figure out how to 3D print something and then go print something for a boy who lost his arms. There's just ramifications to it. And you have to weigh out, you know, what ramifications are you willing to deal with? And for me, the ramifications of helping people far outweigh the risk of failure. They far outweigh stumbling or falling or not, you know, looking stupid or, you know, it's worth it. It's just worth it. What I learned was that when you focus on one person and helping one person, then the ramifications kind of ripple out exponentially. If you start with the exponential and you start with the community, the crowd of people that you're trying to help, people with malaria or people who are hungry or people who are impoverished, you can't really bite into that. It's hard to articulate, it's hard to wrap your arms around it. What I learned was when you focus on Daniel, you can do it, it's achievable. And that's the whole concept of help one, help many. Start with one person, help one person. Once you do that, many will be helped afterwards. Technology is exciting for me because it is limitless potential. Moore's law is the best law ever to have been invented. Technology halves in price and doubles in speed. I think it's getting to the point where that law is obsolete because it's happening even faster now. So the fact that we are moving through many micro industrial revolutions on a monthly basis, a year ago, the 3D printer was a collectible for makers and enthusiasts. This Christmas, Joey from Kansas City might have had it on his Christmas list from Santa. Being able to 3D print and do micro production of your own things is now something that the common person has access to. That is incredible. That's revolutionary. That's the industrial revolution in a $2,000 box that sits on your desk. You don't need the steam engine to do this. It's right there. And I drove it in Africa off of solar powered batteries in a hospital. There's not running water in this place. That's, that's what technology has the potential to do. I obsess about looking inside and checking myself and figuring out how I want to deal with a circumstance or a situation. So I'm constantly looking inside and constantly asking myself a question about what I'm doing or why I'm doing it. So with Not Impossible, all the ideas that get brought to us, can you help us with this and can you help us with that? We have to look inside and figure out, all right, how do we deal with this and who do we put in place and what teams can we build and straight up, no product placement, not because Intel is financing so much of what we're doing right now, but you cannot think of a better concept than the concept of looking inside when you're dealing with how do you address humanity and how do you address helping the world 
through technology.